Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. In verse, uh, let's see, do I have this right? I hope, I hope, I hope. Yeah, Matthew 22, let's start in verse 15. Yes, Matthew twenty-two fifteen. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Now, what you need to notice here is people are out to get Jesus. And the way that they specifically want to get him is they want to throw stuff at him so that he entangles himself and aha, they can say they got it. Now, that really doesn't work so well on somebody who knows what they're talking about. And I mean, who know, I mean, has a clear lay of the land. It's like people that don't and they don't know how this fits with that and the, you know what I mean? It's real easy to, to find something that they'll trip up on. But Jesus does know that. And so they sent unto him, uh, I mean, they, yeah, they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Psh, if they knew they were true, they wouldn't be trying to trip him up. But nonetheless, they're lying squaws, and that's okay. Uh, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou re regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. Um, all right. I think many times we think Jesus is operating on some sort of supersonic God sonar. <laughs> and that's how he perceives this. Folks, if it's self-centered, if it's if somebody you know somebody's flattering and yet you can tell they're trying to catch you, to perceive their wickedness really isn't that big of a deal. It's if you're wicked, it's hard to perceive their wickedness. But if you're not, it's a little, you know. <clears throat> um, so and it says, why test why test me, you hypocrites? And verse 19, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a Daenerys, and he saith unto them. <clears throat> Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left and went their way. <clears throat> and I'm sure the, the great impression of, of incredible words that causes marveling doesn't really change someone's basic nature. They'll be back. <clears throat> but at least you marveled them this time. <clears throat> and it doesn't mean anything. And I, I just want to say, you know, there are many scriptures where it says, and they heard the gracious words of Jesus or that he spoke with great authority. Folks, nine times out of ten, the people that that's talking about never turn to the Lord or in some examples, like I think when he was teaching in, I think when he was teaching in the synagogue in Nazareth, at the same time, they're all saying all these gushy things about him. Before it ends up, they're about to throw him off a cliff at the end of the thing. Okay. So as a preacher, as a minister of the word, just because you can wow people, you haven't done anything. I'm serious. I think that's an important thing but I, because I think that there is some sort of a deal within people who teach deeper life that they think that wowing people and people go, oh, we never heard it on this wise. Well, you know. In most of those cases, if you read it, they did not turn, and eventually they turned back on him. To get this reality on the inside of them is the only thing that will make any difference at all. So, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> all right, Jesus said, to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. 
and to render unto God the things that are God. Well, first, if you just use the example, he took a coin and said, whose superscripture, whose, whose image is on here? It's, in fact, it says image and superscription in one of the translations. Maybe I read it here. <clears throat> and, and he says, they said Caesar's. And he said, okay, this is easy. That's Caesar's. <laughs> it says, whose image and what's written on your heart? Whose image do you have in you? Well, then render unto God the things that are God's, you know. And, of course, that's when they marvel. They go, we didn't catch him. That was really cool. That was nifty. He just went and just got stepped right out of the way of that one. They didn't catch the reality of it. And the reality of it is, uh, well, let me, let me just read. He gives room for their place and lets them have that place, but gives God what he wants to. Yes. You know, I've always saw this in, in sort of a way when he says render under Caesar's what is Caesar's that he's, he, he's spa saying, you know, if you want, if you don't want to pay tribute to Caesar, don't use his money. And then that's about 90% of Caesar's power in the world too yeah. when he says that. Well, that's, I mean, we'd have to jump over a little bit, but why don't we go ahead and do it. Keep your place here. Uh, but over in Romans uh, chapter, what is it, 12 or 13? One of those. Um, yeah, Romans 13, 6, look at this. It says, for for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so we, we're getting a lot of the same words here. You notice that render and, and to, you know, whatever, D just different ones that Jesus used there. And they were talking about paying tribute and stuff here. And, uh, and I think, and I guess my point is, and, and like I said when, some a couple other people made comments. I think there's, I think there's many angles to this. I don't claim to have all the angles down. Uh, I think there's validity in uh, in all these different angles. But the thing that I'm seeing is is something uh, is something more along the lines of like Daniel. 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 Gave advice to an ungodly king, and yet. He wouldn't eat the food that was set before him. Uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king. And yet, when he's back in Israel, he threw people out of the temple. You, you get my point a little bit here, and that is that there seems to be a certain allowance for the what's going on around us that that okay that's your realm and that's fine it's sort of like that you know and i'm i know my words aren't the best but i'm yes We are kenosing ourselves. We are taking the place that God gives us. We're taking the place that is given to us. You understand? We're not. We're not pushing ourselves beyond that. That's that's my point, and that's my goal is is to help us to see that um, um, that I mean it always threw me that Nehemiah and and I mean. For example, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, okay? Well, you know, one reason why he had a cupbearer was he was supposed to drink it to test out to see if it was poisoned and then give it to the king. You know, that's his, a cupbearer isn't just a guy that walks around going, thirsty, thirsty now, thirsty now. You know, <laughs> it wasn't about just thirsty. He drank that cup, and in drinking that cup, he risked his own life uh, anybody see the movie The 300 you remember the king well that was the king <laughs> yeah that was Nehemiah's guy 
Uh, you would think if you're really going to serve God, you'd put poison in it and act like, you know, put like wax on your lips or something, you know, so it doesn't get through or, you know, <laughs> you don't go have a candle come in your mouth. And, Seems pretty good to me. <laughs> and then, and then kill the bad guy, that creepy bad guy, and bring, you know, and then bring, you know, then you sit on the throne and bring glory to God. Well, no. I mean, just before I left tonight on the TV, so I was going out, they had this man on the news, and he's on the stand, and he shot this abortion guy, okay, and he, uh, and so he's on the stand, and, and, and this is on the news, they're showing just a little bit, and they said, okay, did you kill this guy? And he said, yes, I did. Did you shoot him? Yes, I did. Why did you do this? Um, because he was killing babies. And he said, well, you know, so you murdered him for that? And he said, yeah. He said, I, and here's what he said. <laughs> He said, I don't believe anybody has a right to take another life but God. Now, he just shot this guy. <laughs> and, and his whole thing was right, everything he said, except he violated it, you know. And to, to go the way of Nehemiah, the way I just described before I said that, of, you know, acting like you're drinking it and poisoning the guy or something like that, God is more honored with us. And look, I mean, the only godliness in, around, in and around the king in, in Daniel's day was Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what I mean? Um, and it did have an influence on the world. But we think, and that's the deal, we get into all of the, what did I write? We stand for principles and call some things compromise and we miss the Lord. Because we make a stand when maybe we should be kenosis and we're kind and sweet adding honey when we should be acting as a master. Do you understand? I'm, I'm trying to bring in what I taught in the last class, too. We're, we're adding honey to the sacrifice when it shouldn't be there because it's not about being courteous and kind and, and, and um, hospitable and that sort of stuff. And we'll see that when we get into the tables and Jesus sitting at all these different tables. He, he, he takes different positions. And it's so good because it just shows that in all these different places, he's using that same principle. Okay. Now... Again, I, I, I'm sure I'm not covering all bases and stuff. I'm just teaching what I feel like the Lord gave me. So, um, uh, We are to know how to be in kenosis for ourselves while taking what position God gives us. And I made that statement like in relationship to Daniel or Nehemiah. They were kenosis in relationship to the king, but when it came to themselves, eating this or whatever, or, or in, the, in the case of Nehemiah, in Jerusalem, throwing people out of the temple, well, he was the, he was the head guy. He was there. He, he was like the king was back there. Do you understand? And he was taking that stand. So um, so. God himself is going to have to show us how to apply kenosis and in the right way. And life is what we need because Jesus will be kenosis. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sure that's not the proper way that, that grammatically, but you know, he will be in kenosis. Um, Jesus uh, would receive ministry and the substance and the care uh, of godly women. Well, you may not think much of that or, or you may think bad of that, but in that day, women didn't really have as much place as they do in our day. And Jesus would let them meet his need. He would let them take care, let them bring food and stuff like that. And yet, he would go out from that and minister to all the need around him. 
I mean, it's, it's, if that's the place they're giving him, then he takes that. If these people are not doing that, which, you know, and, that, and let me just hit on that point. Honor to whom honor is due means Jesus should get the tip top and furthest extent of official glory from every one of us. Do you understand? He should get that. But he doesn't get that. And he doesn't cry about it because he's in kenosis. Yes, Karen? Well, even in that, he's being too dirty to, to give to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think um, I think all of us have probably experienced the situation when you you were following the Lord at some point and you learned to give you learned to give financially you learned to give of your time you were giving and giving and you found that it was actually more blessed to give than receive right and so you, you actually started developing a lifestyle of that. And then somebody walked up and tried to slip you, you know, a $10 bill, a $20, you know, a $100 bill. Oh, I can't receive this. Oh, no, no, no. Because, you know, it was all giving on our part. So this isn't giving this. Oh, no, I can't receive this. But can't you give in such a manner that they can give? I mean, it really is that. It is allowing them. I mean, you know, we say it's more blessed to give than receive. Well, then bless them and let them be blessed in, in giving. And, and, uh, and that's not a cover-up for, <laughs> I really wanted this money anyway. You know, that's, that's, if that's lurking in you, you need to, you know, take the cross and apply that along with a little wolf bane. Not really. I'm, I'm kidding. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, and um, <laughs> but but that giving thing uh, that you're describing there, you know, uh, allowing them to give is self-giving. You know, I think I think Jesus probably, in many ways, according to his nature, is more comfortable in giving. I think he is, but he is what he is and should be honored. You see. Yes. Well, even in our our church services and stuff, you know, I, I, I I've taken maybe one offering and. 10, 15 years. I mean, but, but there's a reason for that. When I was responsible for taking the offerings, I would forget. Right? I did that many, I'd just forget. How do you forget the offering? You're a pastor. And when I wouldn't forget, I would take the offering and then pass it back out and say, okay, anybody that has a need, take whatever you need out of there. You know? And, uh, you know, people go, give me that. We ain't letting you take the offering anymore. <laughs> well, now it wouldn't be much. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, the gesture isn't even funny. <laughs> it's an insult. But actually, there was a day when, um, it was, you know. All right. Um, let's look in Mark chapter uh, 2. <clears throat> I think this is the one. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> I'm sorry I do a lot of that. I think that's what it is, but I many times I'll look up scriptures and I'll mark them down, and I've been caught several times having the wrong scripture, and it's very frustrating when you do that. <clears throat> Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and again he entered into Capernaum, and after some days it was reported that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, who was 
borne by four. And when they could not come near unto him for the, crowd, they, uh, for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed in which the sick of the palsy lay. Uh, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. And of course, he ends up being healed. Now, one of the things I'd like you to notice is every time that he brings up faith, it seems to be noticing that somebody's coming in on a certain basis. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're relating to him in a certain way, and he says, be it unto you according to your faith. You know, I mean, I know we've, we've taken that to just, you know, healing and, you know, whatever, miracles and all that kind of stuff. But, but I perceive that Jesus is sitting there talking, sharing, and I thought this was interesting. They were in the house. The house was full. And he wasn't doing miracles. He was sharing the word. So I think there were some hungry people there. I, I mean, I really believe that. I believe that there were people who were not just trying to get, you know, something for themselves out of it, but that they were listening and drawing from what was him. And Mary, I think, did that when she sat at his feet. We'll get into all that later. <clears throat> and so, but there comes these people, these four guys, and they're carrying this guy sick of the palsy. And they're wanting to get him to Jesus because like that woman with the issue of blood, she said in herself, didn't even say it out loud, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Well, do you think, do you think that word of that, because it says word spread everywhere, right? You remember that? Word spread everywhere. Do you think anybody else ever snuck up behind Jesus, touched the hem of his garment and, and got healed or, or didn't get healed? Do you think that's possible someone might not have gotten healed? Do you think maybe somebody heard the story and thought just going through the motions would do it? Yeah. Do you think anybody ever came up in a, in a prayer line and didn't get healed? Do you think that, you know, I know it looks like everybody does, but I mean that somebody might not have. But this, these four guys are carrying this guy, and it doesn't even necessarily seem to be talking to the guy of the palsy. It almost seems like it's talking to these four guys. Be it unto you according to your faith. If we can get this guy to Jesus. Now, Jesus already had explained in other places. You know, one guy came up to him and said, look, my daughter's sick, you know, unto death and stuff, and I don't want to bother you. I don't need to drag you all the way out to my house. You just send the word and she'll be healed. Remember that? And Jesus was really impressed with that because we're so, oh, yeah, it has to be proximity. It can't be the actual just spiritual reality that is true. It, it has to be. So, you know, time the guy got back to the house, she was up and around. In this case, they believe we got to get him to Jesus. So they tear the roof off. And Jesus doesn't go, you idiots. This isn't, what, pardon? This isn't your house. Yeah, well, this isn't even my house. Not only that, but this isn't a healing meeting. This is a word of, it's a conference going on here. Or, or any number of things. Jesus dealt with it right then and there, and I bet you he went right back to, to sharing the word. Okay. You know, we're always trying to figure everything out. It's like, it's like we're going through life, we're going through ministry, we're going through church and everything, and we're trying to use what, what people call discernment. Ooh, ooh, we're just trying to feel what should I do now? What should I have done then? What will I do when this comes up? Ooh. And it's like some sort of a something is going to come over you and you're going to figure it out. What if there actually was just a practical kenosis to this thing that sort of di di dictated how things went? What, what if it was actually that simple? What if Jesus answering their question when they're trying to entangle him with his words 
got out of it so easy because to him it's all cut and dried. Okay, render to Caesar the you know, like Mallory said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the things that are God. Render what God should give. You know. Well, you know. Well, should we? Um, you know, shouldn't Daniel have killed that king, Nebuchadnezzar? No. And the philosophies rise and they come from every angle and everybody's got an angle. But God's the one that we need to get hold of. And the thing that amazed me about this, and, and Mallory uh, really has taken a lot of this to heart and has come to me after classes and other times and just shared an abundance of places you wouldn't believe of where this proves out to be the case. Uh, it, sir, I mean, she's finding it not even in the Gospels. She's finding it everywhere. But the Gospels will definitely bear this out because this is the Jesus approach. What's it called? Kenosis. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, we need to get down here. Um, <clears throat> Let me just read here. Jesus responded greatly to those who honored him to such a degree as to tear the roof off. He did not reject it. He only veiled it when men did not accept it by their own free will. He himself would take the lowest seat unless someone said, come up here. He was not forced into this path, but he freely chose it. And this is so important. I mean, I cannot stress this because... Most people that take the lowest seat feel like they're forced into it. Let me, let me give you an example. We finished that scripture. Back in um, Romans, I think it's Romans 12, it, it speaks of this same kind of stuff. Um, I'll read this one verse and then I'll, I'll show what I'm saying. Um, I made the statement, uh, he was not forced into this path, but freely chose it. And, when, and I said, when we take the lowest seat, we feel like we're forced into it. Um, in uh, Romans 12 and in verse uh, 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Does it make a big difference in that phrase to put in honor? Prefer, I mean, have you ever heard the phrase preferring one another? Is it possible to prefer one another without doing it in honor? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's my point. I'm not, I'm not talking about taking the lowest seat. I'm talking about a spirit of kenosis. How does that, yes, it may manifest in taking the lowest seat, but it may also manifest in, in coming up or, you know what I mean, if that honor to whom honor is given and responding in that situation. It's not just being in the lowest seat and it's not honor, it's not preferring somebody while we grudgingly do that. Okay. We, we want honor. I think, I, think there's, I think that can be a negative thing, and I think there's a, a portion of us that it's okay if it's done in the Lord. Um, to whom be honor, glory, forever and ever, speaking of the Lamb. This thing of honor, Jesus, and Jesus knowing that he'd come from the Father and is going back to the Father, girded himself and got down and washed the disciples' feet. He, he didn't need to have outward proofs of who he was. I mean, he didn't. So he could get, you know, is there a fear that if, if Jesus washes their feet, they're going to think they're better than Jesus. Okay, that doesn't come to our mind. 
But is there a fear that if we honor, if we do, if we prefer somebody in honor, that they're going to take that like they're better than you? If you do that often enough, you're going to eventually run into one that does. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It, but it doesn't matter to one who's in kenosis. Um, I remember a turmoil that I went through where I wished that, you know, and this has been a long time back, I was quite a bit younger, I wished that certain people, not, not even necessarily specific people, but that, that there would be some honor that would come my way. And, and the father basically said to me, that ain't going to happen. He said, but here's what he said. But I want you to give honor to people. I want you to do unto others what you would like them to do unto you. Not so that they will, because it doesn't say do unto others and they will do that to you. It says do unto others what you would wish would happen, but as he was saying to me, but won't in your case. And, and I, it's as if he opened my eyes to see the areas that uh, certain people would be blessed in being honored. Um, you know, this is just, this was something that was in my heart. But you know, Brother Lemon's quite a bit older than me and stuff like that, not quite a bit, but he's older than me and he's, uh, you know, he's been faithful for a lot of years. And uh, while there are a lot of people that honor him, I don't know that they all honor him in the right way. Okay? Maybe with official glory more than they should. But it came into my heart that we as a church, and you'll remember this, work up a lifetime achievement certificate, and we all signed it, and it said, to someone who has faithfully given their life, suffering trials, going through da 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 da, you'll never know how much that meant to him. Because it wasn't just the regular honor that people give, it was the seeing what counted and trying our best to put it down. And it just ministered so much. And it's in his wall of plaques, it's right in the middle. You know, it, it is, and uh, and it's and it, but it touched his heart. I don't believe it just petted his flesh. In fact, I wouldn't have done it if I thought it petted his flesh, especially me. To him, I don't pet his flesh. I love him, but I don't pet his flesh. No, I did this in the Lord. And I believe, and I've, and I've done that and other things, not that same thing. In different times when I felt prompted of the Lord because everybody's waiting for it to get to, to come to them. But, you know, somebody's got to do it for others. Do you understand? what Somebody's got to do it. Honor to whom honor is due. Not flattery, not flattery. <clears throat> but then there comes that thought, if I honor them and them and them and them and them, then they're all going to think they're better than me and then I'll always be the low man on the totem pole. Or have to sit in the lowest seat. Can't we just sit there and go, I love you guys. Anybody need anything? <laughs> can't we just do that and be happy with that yeah you know in their tone and in their condescending way yeah uh, brother come here and uh, get me another cup of coffee sure I'll get right on that because we worry how we're going to appear 
We may not want to do that. But if you do it in honor, in the spirit of what the Lord's talking about, I mean, there's, there's an abundance of scriptures here. Uh, look at verse 14. Bless them who persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice them that do rejoice, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Here we go. Be, verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Uh, you know, some, about two years ago, the Lord put that scripture on my heart. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. <coughs> he made me memorize it and call it up constantly. And when I'd get in certain situations, I knew what to do. <laughs> you know, what is that? What do you do? You kenosis. You empty yourself. You become of no rep reputation. But at the same time, you can actually give honor to someone else. Honor to whom honor is due. All right, let me just finish with just this thought out of, um, in these scriptures. I mean, uh, everyone's familiar with Romans 12, 1 and 2. Verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Everybody knows that? But then look down, for I say, through the grace of God given unto me to every man who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to be think soberly according as God hath dealt every man the measure of faith. And then it goes into all of this stuff. Don't mind high things, you know, uh, uh, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate and um, bless them who persecute you and all this kind of stuff. What if, this is just a what if, what if the transformation by the renewing of your mind was this kind of stuff? What if that was actually the revelation of Christ? And I think that's, I think that's what Carolyn Allen was trying to say when she said, well, then they don't know the Lord. If they, you know. What if the transformation isn't into some glorious know-it-all, some great conference speaker or some body with incredible reputation, but with someone, not necessarily with a bad reputation, I'm, I, I would never hold myself up. <laughs> I don't suggest you go get a bad reputation. But no reputation. Made himself of no reputation when he was the highest, when he was the grandest, when he was, and yet nobody honored him that, and all he did was give honor to whom honor was due by healing the people that break a hole in the roof and stops his sharing and, you know. What if that is the transformation? That would be pretty cool. What's, how, do, how does, in the proverbial words of, Chris Farley, that, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> All right. Um, he, was, uh, he did not wish to be honored for honor's sake. Gosh, that's, that's really a good sentence, though. I mean, sh you're bragging on your writing. I, I write a good one every once in a while. That he did not wish to be honored for honor's sake. What truly received and apprehended him would find that he would take his place. But what rejected him or belittled him or made him small was not forced to accept what was innately true of him. What was innately true of him just was true. He was okay with just him and God knowing that. <laughs> he sought reality in people and not just nominal converts. What I, why I'm saying that is he's not looking for people who'll just give, uh, uh, how do I say that, honor for honor's sake. It's better to have one person that truly, innately sees the Lord in you and honors it.
than a whole bunch of people, a whole church full of people that treat you with respect when in reality, uh, what was the wording that he sought reality in people, not just nominal converts. In reality, they didn't really honor the innate character of him. How much time we got left? Okay, I'm gonna just try to read here. Well, we've got a few scriptures and move on and see if I can't get this little section done. And, and believe it or not, when we finish this tonight, we will, in this course, have finished what's called the introduction. <laughs> All right, Hebrews 1. If you would, please, Hebrews 1. In verse 3, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus being the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of his person, and let's just stop right there, Jesus was the brightness of his glory. My Lord, he was the brightness of the Father's glory. The brightest glory that the Father ever got was that guy right there, and his name's Jesus. And, and he didn't come down here and show off, and he didn't son of God his way through the thing. He became a man, and he kenosis his way through it, and there's the brightness of his glory, and him he hath highly exalted and set on a throne that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Do you understand the process of this thing? But it didn't just say the brightness of his glory. It says the express image of his person, or I like saying it like this, the expressed image. The expressed image. He expressed that image of God. And that image of God that he was expressing wasn't, and again, we'll get into this later specifically and deal with this, but it wasn't just miracles and power as many assume, it was the divine nature in human flesh. It was the word made flesh and dwelling among us. <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, First John. First John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Notice the wording, please. That which was from the beginning we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Do you all get what that's saying? They're saying, look, we didn't really know this Jesus guy walking around. We, when we handled him, when we touched him, we eventually saw beyond just Jesus doing miracles and doing good stuff, uh, just like uh, Moses did or just like Elijah or Elisha did doing miracles and doing stuff. We didn't see that. We literally saw him that was from the beginning, who was with the Father. When we touched, that's what we were touching. We saw him. We actually saw him. We experienced the innate essence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That which was from the beginning we have seen. Most people didn't see that which was from the beginning. They didn't see the eternal life. They didn't see this selfless, endless, eternal life. They saw a fixer. They saw a healer. They saw a feeder. They saw... Someone that would meet them on the level of faith that they had, and he would. 
But these guys expanded their level and he met them there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He met them there and they saw the brightness of the glory of the Father. A kenosis man. <laughs> they saw the expressed image of God being expressed through a man. Praise God. All right, so let me read a little bit. As Jesus passed through their lives, the eye of man was incapable of tracking it. But to God, it was all incense, a sacrifice of sweet savor, the meat offering of the sanctuary. You can displace this or teach it, but only those in the secret place understood in nature and practice this reality. If men started measuring themselves by him and saw a contrast, then they might see their need. But they will never see their need, folks, unless they see beyond the miracles, unless they see beyond what he can do for you into the contrast, the law of contrast being enacted. And, and for most Christians, the law of contrast is not enacted. They can come right up and rub elbows with Jesus and would you heal me? Would you do this? And da 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 da. But those who did see it, the Job's and the Isaiah's and the Paul's and who saw the contrast, they fall down and they say, oh, wretched man that I am. They fall down and they say, I am unclean and I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. They say, I, I, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now I see thee face to face and I abhor myself. The contrast has kicked in. I'm pure selfishness and pride and you Pure selfless, in motive, in motive. <clears throat> he is God's temple. But for the ones who didn't see, his glory had departed outwardly. Like Ezekiel's temple. He walked as Ezekiel's temple. And the glory had departed. They didn't see the glory. They didn't comprehend it. They didn't, they just saw a man. They just saw a blessed man, a, 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 a gifted man. But for them, they didn't see the glory in that temple. If we are to see the Shekinah, it will only be discerned by its nature and virtues that are inward. He is the expressed image of God. Only the disciples saw and said that which was from the beginning we have seen and handled. But we cannot do this based on religious principle, but on life principle. There are principles that you can learn, but they become religious principles. When you learn Christ, his forming within you, the transformation of him over us is a principled life, meaning it does things a certain way, selflessly follows a certain pattern in a certain order. To discover the pattern is not to discover the law. And it's not even truly to discover the principle. Even though you can, you can outline it. Well, there was a day in my walk and in the circles that I was with that to be able to outline it on the chalkboard was almost the highest thing. I used to use this chalkboard every time that I ever taught, just about. 
I don't use it hardly at all now because you think you got it when it's all outlined. Oh, yeah, okay, now I got the principle. No, no, no. First of all, I don't want you to get what's on the chalkboard. I want you to get the life, and with the life comes the principle. You reach forth your nail-scarred hand, because it's his hand and you're his body. You being that hand, because we say, well, we're, the, we're his hands and we're his feet. We're, we're, we take Jesus to the world, amen? Well, if you're his hand or you're his feet, you're not just hands and feet that take Jesus. You are nail-scarred. You are nail scarred. And greater than that, the, the life flow, the, 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 the juice, the sap that is vine life is principled to either reach forth its hand or not. God's not going to make you omniscient, all knowing. He's not going to give you all knowledge to know when to reach forth and when not to. He's not going to do it. That's not his method. He doesn't want to do that. He's not trying to intellectualize you or, or through academia bring you into an understanding of how to proceed. He wants the life of his son in his body so that you don't, and, and Shay mentioned this, so that ultimately you don't have to learn the principles. Christ is formed in you, and the principles just come. And learning the principles can puff you up or make you think you know something that you don't know. When the heart should be set on knowing the Lord, period, that the heart should be given, and where the heart is, that's where your treasure will be found. <coughs> Wherever your heart has set itself, it has set itself on its treasure. And if that treasure is family, then you'll go to family. And if that treasure is, is something you like on your job, then you'll go there. And if that thing is to, to become a religious guru that knows stuff, then you'll, your heart will go. But if your heart is on Jesus, you cannot and will not be satisfied. I'm sorry, you won't be until the vine life sap is producing what's being taught. <laughs> and, and let me just end by saying this. It's just hearing the principles isn't necessarily bad. This is what brought me into this. The hearing them can bring about and can enact, can turn the light switch on that enacts the law of contrast. It's the, it's the prior stage <laughs> it's the prior stage to really knowing the Lord. And you say, where do you get that from and how do we know that's true? Well, it's called Revelation, I mean, uh, Romans 7 and then Romans 8. It's called, O wretched man that I am, who? And then Christ is the fullness of it all. So the first revelation, if you will, I'm going to put it like this, and this isn't the best way, that, but I'm not the best teacher. Makes sense that I wouldn't say it the best way. But the first revelation you need to come to is a contrast of you to him so that once you see that, you will want him more than you'll want knowledge. But if that contrast never comes, then you'll want knowledge because with knowledge comes in your mind, hmm. official glory. <laughs> and, and you may get official glory, but there's a higher glory and that will glorify the Father. And that kenosis one, Christ, whether it was 2,000 years ago or in you or in his body today, is the brightness of the Father's glory. 
Amen. All right, let's let's pray. Father, we just ask you to move our hearts out of the realm of simply learning things. And God, that there might be a people on this planet that are just so hungry for you that they can't stand it. They just cannot be satisfied. They want more of you. And their heart is crying out, not I, but Christ. He must increase and I must decrease. Father, move by your spirit. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. All right, we're just...